welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and I'm joined with a very special guest today, Brandon Vaught. How are you, Brandon? Hey, Adrian. Good to be with you. Doing well. Great, great, great. Well, uh, for those, th- those listeners who don't know, uh, Brandon is kind of a superpower in the Catholic world. <laughs> he, uh, he's a content director at The Word on Fire, but he also has a podcast with them, The Word on Fire Show, right? And, That's right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, on top of that, he's a blogger. And uh, most importantly, for our purposes, he's on the board of our society, the Society of G.K. Chesterton. That's my uh, proudest accomplishment. <laughs> first, first on oh, the no. resume list. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's great for us. But um, yeah, but uh, he's done a ton of other things. I'm actually pretty amazed when I was looking at your bio. I, I can't believe you've accomplished all that. And, and you're, aren't you like 34? I, I hope I'm not outing anyone. <laughs> 30, yeah, I got to even do the math now. 30, 34, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I'm 34. Okay. okay, wow, that's, that's very impressive. Well, um, thank you for being with us. Uh, my pleasure, glad to be here. Cool. Well, today uh, we wanted to talk about something that you're an expert on, uh, which is defending our faith in today's culture and to, in today's world. And, uh, and so on top of all your accomplishments, you've written two books recently. Uh, the, the most recent one is What to Say and How to Say It, uh, Discussing Your Catholic Faith with Clarity and Confidence, right? And the other one is Why I Am Catholic, right? And, and, uh, these, and, and on, top, well, yeah, on top of that, you've, you've started Claritas U, which is an online program to help us, to help Catholics talk about their faith. So let's, let's talk about our faith. Um, let's do like an accelerated course that we could knock out in half an hour. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great. It, all of this stuff is something I've been working on for many, many years. So I'm a convert to the faith. So I, I was raised in a Protestant background and it was in college when I, I discovered GK Chesterton. He played a major role in my conversion process, uh, but I became Catholic my senior year in college. This was about 10, 12 years ago. And ever since then, I've been in love with the whole world of apologetics, which means just defending your faith, offering reasons for why you believe what you do, and evangelization, which is the more positive explanation of the faith. Uh, But I was discouraged after becoming Catholic, seeing how few Catholics were confident and articulate in explaining to others why they believe what they do. Apologetics was a huge deal in my Protestant circles, a lot of my Protestant friends could make very persuasive cases for God and Jesus's divinity and the Bible and the resurrection of Christ and all this stuff. But when I became Catholic, what I encountered by and large, and this is my experience, I'm just extrapolating it to the general Catholic population that most Catholics love their faith. They love going to mass. They love praying. They love Catholic devotionals like the rosary. They love their parish. They love the people there their faith means a lot to them. It's deeply ingrained. However, whenever they're challenged about their faith, particularly from non-Catholic skeptics who question, you know, why do you believe X, Y, or Z, this moral view, this religious belief, most Catholics get tongue-tied and nervous and afraid. They know what they believe, but they don't know how to articulate it to others. So that's kind of the problem that I've been focusing on for the last several years from all sorts of different angles. Um, So you mentioned three of the initiatives that I've spearheaded. Um, Two of them are books. So the first one, Why I'm Catholic and You Should Be Too, was kind of my case to mostly skeptics as to why they should take the Catholic Church seriously. Um, I wrote it with atheists and agnostics and former Catholics and the religiously unaffiliated in mind. It was, it was aiming to make the case from ground zero to someone who doesn't believe in God, doesn't think religion's important, why they should at least consider these things. And then that was followed by my most recent book, What to Say and How to Say It, which was more of a defensive approach. So why I'm Catholic is kind of the offense or the positive presentation. And then this what to say and how to say it is more of a defense of some of the church's most controversial beliefs. So we have chapters on things like same-sex marriage, transgenderism, abortion, atheism. So things that make most Catholics terrified if they ever came up in conversation. I don't want to touch that with a 20-foot pole. Uh, But through that, I coach and help Catholics in exactly what to say and how to say it. And then the third thing, which is Claritas U, uh, it undergirds both of those two books. In fact, those two books kind of arose from all my work at Claritas U. Claritas U is an online platform I developed to help Catholics get clear about three things. Number one, 
what we believe as Catholics. So this can sometimes be the most challenging. Even most Catholics uh, have a hard time making the proper distinctions about what we do and don't believe about some of these hot button issues. So first of all, what we believe. Second, the best objections to those beliefs. I found that for a lot of Catholics, it's liberating to learn the best objections to your beliefs in a safe place like Claritas U or on the internet or in podcasts like this, so that when you encounter those objections out in the wild, when you're talking with friends or family or coworkers, they're not surprising and they're not intimidating because you've already heard them. You've already become familiar with them. So that's what I'm trying to do is inoculate Catholics against these common objections by exposing them to, to Catholics early and privately in a safe environment. And then thirdly, how to respond to those top objections. Once you know the top objections and how to respond to them, you're far more cool and confident. You're not rattled whenever you discover them in, in the words of critics. Um, so that's kind of the overarching uh, initiative that I've worked on through these books and through Claritas U is helping Catholics to understand what they believe, understand the best objections to those beliefs, and then understand how to respond to them. Great. Uh, yeah, that makes total sense. Wow. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's start with a specific, a specific thing that um, I would like to defend uh, in a lot of my conversations. Because uh, a personal struggle that I have when I'm talking to non Christians, actually, this is, this is more of a of a one for Christianity versus just Catholicism. Uh, it's it's the the first step is proving that there's a God, and there's a lot of resources and material on that. I mean, Thomas Aquinas has great proofs about uh, the existence of God, uh, but then the, eventually you have to to prove that God loves you, and not only that, but you need to have or you want you want to have a personal relationship with Jesus. The son of God. And that's, that's where I, it's just much, much more difficult. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, you can't figure it out in one conversation. Uh, but, but that's, I think I, I see people get stuck on just the proof of God and it kind of gets conflated with, oh, well then it, we just assume that therefore God loves you and all of this other Christian, <laughs> Christian beliefs. And, and that's, that's, that's the difficult thing for me. So do you have any advice or guidance on that? Yeah, it's a good question, Adrian. You know, a lot of people, when they put forward the arguments for God's existence, whether they're Thomas Aquinas' arguments or arguments from Aristotle or Anselm or wherever they're from, they don't realize that that gets you only part of the way. Thomas Aquinas himself famously said that the arguments only lead to like a thin slice of God. But in order to know that God is love, that's something that we get through revelation. We only know that God is love because the scriptures tell us that fact. We can't reason ourselves to the fact that God is love. Um, so that's, that's critical because it means that reasons alone, arguments alone, can't lead somebody to that conclusion. Not only that God is love, but that God loves you, that God wants to be in a loving relationship with you. That's something where we have to turn to sources beyond rational argument. And that's where we get into the scriptures. Um, but here's, here's kind of how I would lead someone down that path. So I like how you already acknowledge that there's uh, a logical progression when you're leading somebody from like totally anti-religious, no religious beliefs at all, to a loving relationship with Christ. There are so many intermediate steps you have to traverse. So first of all, you have to help convince them that God exists. If they still don't believe God exists, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It doesn't matter yeah. that there's a divine being that wants a relationship with them. So first, God exists. Second, you want to convince them that Jesus Christ is God. Um, you know, the scriptures use the language of the son of God, but for our purposes, that Jesus is divine. And the way to do that is by focusing on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's the clearest proof that Jesus was God because by him being raised from the dead, all of his claims to be God were vindicated. So throughout Jesus's life, he does things and he says things that only God can do. So for example, he forgives sins or he overturns the Mosaic law or he does things on the Sabbath. And when he's challenged, he says, the son of man is greater than the Sabbath. Well, there's only one thing greater than the Sabbath. That's God himself. So he kind of hints in veiled ways that he's God, but it's only through his resurrection that, that all of those claims and illusions are vindicated. And we know for a fact that Jesus is divine. Once you know that Jesus is God, 
then we can believe what Jesus says. And throughout Jesus's rhetoric in the, in the four gospels, we see him revealing this God of love, that God is not just a distant, uncaring force, but he's a father. That's Jesus's language, that God is a loving father. You know, he uses that term of endearment, Abba, that it's almost like God is a dad. He's a daddy. That's, that's the close, intimate uh, connection that we have to God. But then to take it one more step further, later on in the New Testament, the letter of First John explicitly says that God is love. And John is, of course, the, the uh, author, the gospel writer who most emphasizes love and that dimension of God throughout his, uh, his gospel. So anyway, that's kind of the path that I take someone down is first help them to believe in God through rational arguments. Next, help them to believe that Jesus is God. And then look at the ways Jesus talks about God, that God is a loving father, that God loves you. He wants to be united to you. He wants to move into your heart and invade your soul and then move through the rest of the New Testament where that uh, language is fleshed out even more specifically in the letters of, of John. But then finally, the final step is to help somebody to have a personal experience of God. Now, there are a million ways to do this. And I mean, saints and spiritual masters have advocated all sorts of uh, uh, practices up and down the century. So you have everything from like St. Ignatius of Loyola have, inviting people to go on a, a personal quiet retreat and meditate and contemplate on some of the events of scripture. And it's through that meditation that you come to encounter the loving God. Um, many other saints would have you uh, move in with other Christians and follow their way of life. And it's through this living of the way that you encounter the love of God. Um, for others, it's just reading the New Testament and the, the living word of the scriptures will leap into our hearts and establish this uh, sense of a loving connection with God. Um, there's tons of ways to take that final step. And in some ways that's out of our control. We, at that point, we just trust the Holy Spirit to kind of mm -hmm. direct the person in the right way, but we can sort of set the conditions around it to make it more likely. Um, so that's, that's kind of the approach I'd take. You can't argue someone into believing that God loves them. It's something that ultimately they have to encounter for themselves. That's something that each of the last few popes have been very strong about, particularly Pope right. Benedict, that, mm -hmm. that Christianity uh, is is not just a transmission of knowledge; it's an encounter with with Jesus Christ that we have to help people to experience. Right, because this is about defending our faith, not beating someone over the head with the Bible. Right? Yeah, right. That, that makes right. that makes total sense. Uh, well, well, let's say we're talking with someone who who already believes that God exists and that and that He loves us and that we should have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, well, let's say we're that we're that far. Uh, well, what if now we we are presented with the uh, the argument about that the, the 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 catholic church is not the the way to do that uh and and we have to defend the the institution of the catholic church uh that that's i mean we've we've faced that many times too i i face that i've, I've talked to protestants who like you said are very well versed uh especially in their, in their bible um how do we how do we uh, uh confront these arguments that the church is old fashioned, it's out of touch, it's, it's not inclusive, it's controlling, it's, it's corrupt. Uh, I know this is a loaded question, but, but how, do we, how do we defend against that? Well, this is where our good friend G.K. Chesterton comes <laughs> right into the stage. Oh, because, he's right behind me. <laughs> yeah, he's gazing for, for those us. who can't see this, I have a, I have a big uh, portrait of Chesterton behind me. <laughs> he's, kind of, he's kind of leering and glittering over this because yeah, these yeah. are all the same uh, criticisms and attacks that he dealt with that religion in general, but Catholicism in particular, is stodgy and old fashioned and rigid and mm -hmm. out of date and all this stuff. And Chesterton battled expertly against all this stuff. If you want the best single book length response to these charges, just read Orthodoxy, because I think Orthodoxy uh, just totally devastates each of these criticisms. But I'll say just a few brief things. So, um, Which, sorry, have, he, he wrote Orthodoxy, right? He, he wrote it before he was Catholic. Eight years, that's right? right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it, yeah that's kind of, of <laughs> helpful to, to know for when, when we're talking to someone uh, yeah. Who, yeah, who's, who's not Catholic. Yeah. A lot of people thought that that book was kind of his coming out announcement, yeah. that he was just coming out as a Catholic, and they congratulated him on converting to yeah, Catholicism, <laughs> even though he was still a high church Anglican at the time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I, 
I think we need to do a few things. So one is one direction you can take is by responding to those critical accusations one by one by one. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of work. So for example, the church is old fashioned. Well, why is being old fashioned a bad thing? Like Chesterton wrote a lot about the dangers of following fashions and why following fashions is actually the regrettable phenomena, not, not embracing something that's old. Mm. Um, C.S. Lewis offered the term chronological snobbery to people who thought just because something newer is newer, it's, it's de facto better. And, and he was speaking specifically about philosophies and religions. Just because a philosophy is modern doesn't mean it's de facto better than an ancient philosophy. We need to ask which one's true. And that's what you want to keep directing people to when they're criticizing the church in this way. Like maybe it is old, maybe it's out of fashion, but what really matters is whether what it says is true. What we're interested in is the truth, not how old something is. I think Chesterton used the analogy like, um, I'm going to believe, you know, it, it's wrong to say that, that, that uh, this view is, is um, disagreeable because it was offered on Wednesday when today is Sunday. <laughs> that, yeah. Nobody would make that case when it comes to days of the week. So we shouldn't make it when it comes to centuries. It is true that the Catholic church is centuries old, but I see that as a feature and not a flaw. Um, and then we could, we could walk through each of the other ones, like it's out of touch or it's not inclusive, it's controlling, it's corrupt, all the ones you mentioned. But I found that responding one by one is mm -hmm. often counterproductive. The, the bigger thing you want to do is to help somebody see that Jesus, if they're already convinced, as you said, that like God exists, Jesus is God, God is love, Jesus is love, Jesus wants to have the personal relationship with him, all that stuff. If they're to that point, then they want to follow Jesus and they want to do whatever Jesus wants them to do. They want to give their lives to him. And so we can raise the question, well, when Jesus left this earth, when he ascended into heaven, what did he leave us? Did he just abandon the Christians or did he leave them something to continue to guide them? And you could say, well, he left the Holy Spirit. And that's true, but he didn't only leave the Holy Spirit. He also left a church. He didn't leave a Bible. Jesus, we'd have no records of Jesus writing anything except when he scribbled in the sand. He never left a book. He never left writings. He never left a Bible. What he left was a church. And Jesus is very clear that the church is singular. He didn't leave multiple churches. When he told Peter that he was establishing the church, he said, and on this rock, I will establish my church, singular. And he and the other New Testament writers always speak of it in the singular form as if it's, there's just one church. Um, so if Jesus left us with one church, I mean, anybody who wants to follow Jesus would, would rightly say, well, I want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of the church that Jesus established and not one started by someone else. So then that leads to the next question, which is, well, what church today, if any, has the best claim to being the church that Jesus established? And the easiest way to do that is to see which of the churches can trace their lineage all the way back to Jesus and the apostles. And there's really only two churches that can do that, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Every other spinoff arose no less than, or excuse me, um, no more than five or 600 years ago at the time of the Protestant Reformation. So the Anglican Church, the Lutheran Church, uh, all forms of Calvinism, Reformed Calvinism, Evangelicalism, you know, the local church down the road from you, the non-denominational church, all of these churches were started by men relatively recently. There's only one church, either the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, that stems all the way back to Jesus himself and his apostles. Um, and then there's a little bit more work we'd have to do to show why the Catholic Church, with its um, with, with the Pope and the magisterium as the ultimate earthly authorities of the church are more in line with the church Jesus established than Eastern Orthodoxy. But that at least be the, the general direction that I would go is instead of responding to these, you know, almost slogan insults that the church is old or stodgy or out of, out of touch, use sort of a, a logical progression to show somebody that number one, Jesus established one church. Number two, I want to be a part of the church that Jesus established. So number three, which church is that? How do we find it? Um, and I, again, I think the Catholic church has the best claim to be the historical church that Jesus started. Wow. Yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> that's, 
that that's what I will use next time I am talking to a Protestant. <laughs> that's great. Uh, well, I have one more question, one more big question. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, people don't really, they don't really care about religion. Uh, and they, they don't care enough to attack it or, or even mention it. So it's, so a lot of times we're put in a position where we don't really need to, we don't need to defend it, but we, we don't ever have the chance to talk about it. Uh, at least at social gatherings or a lot of times when you see your colleagues and friends and stuff and you don't want to be that person that, you know, comes across as a Bible thumper and just unpleasant and, and, uh, you want to present your faith in an attractive way. Um, how how do you say that we should go about doing that? Yeah, my favorite approach is the same one used by Socrates and Jesus, which is to ask far more questions than you do offer assertions. Um, questions have so many advantages. So number one, when you ask somebody a question about what they believe, you do several things at once. You acknowledge that that you care about what they believe. So you're, you're giving them a sense of dignity, like, Hey, what you say matters. And I really care about it. I want to listen to it. I want to hear you. Number two, it takes the spotlight away from you and, and your views and shines it on theirs. So maybe you're not that articulate or not that confident, but by asking questions about what the other person believes, they're the ones that are standing on the platform, having to talk about their faith or their beliefs or their atheism or agnosticism. Number three, questions will give you some valuable information about the other person's belief structure. So oftentimes when we talk with somebody, we make all sorts of assumptions about what they do or don't believe that are usually erroneous and lead us in all sorts of pointless directions. But if we let the other person talk first, we can get a better sense of what they believe and therefore how to respond. And then finally, and I, I think this is the most important thing, by asking the right questions, you can help to prod and poke and sometimes even undermine the other person's beliefs. You can ask questions that cause them to reflect on their own beliefs and wonder if there might be some holes in there or might be some presuppositions that aren't justified. Um, so I, whenever I'm either you know engaging strangers or, or the, the topic of religion or morality arises or whether I'm engaging people online, I always favor a question-based approach. Mm -hmm. It also has the advantage of, of being fairly non-confrontational. It's not me throwing my thoughts down your throat and you shouting your responses back at me. Uh, it's more low-key and informal. And I, I'm just curious to hear, you know, what you believe about that. Uh, in so, my so what if, what, here, I have, a, I have a question. What if uh, you are talking to someone and you do that and they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm a Lutheran, but I'm, I don't really go to mass anymore. All right. Sorry. I don't go to uh, Lutheran services anymore. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I don't really, I don't really believe anything. I've heard this a number of times. Uh, what would you say to that? Cause, cause they are clearly, um, you know, disenfranchised and they're just, they're, they don't really believe anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what would, how would you continue that conversation? Yeah. I mean, there's so many questions that I'd be interested to ask. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, tell, like, tell me more about that. Tell me about what was your faith background like growing up? Like, were, did you go to church growing up? Was it just because your parents made you or did you want to go? Did you like it? Did you find it compelling? So uh, get them to start thinking. Also. Yeah. Get them to start reflecting on their background. And then, you know, what I like to do is focus on the pivotal question of, well, why did you stop? Like if you went to church growing up and then you stopped going, what changed or what shifted, you know? And for many people, it'll be something like, well, I just went to church because my parents dragged me there. And then, you know, once I got to college or once I started working and moved out of the house, then, you know, I kind of just stopped going. I really didn't believe any of that stuff. If you can get them to that point, then you've already picked up on a lot of valuable information. For example, you've discovered that they never really believed what their church taught. They were kind of just going through the motion. So that means that they never had a strong conviction ever that God existed or that Jesus is God or that Jesus loves them. Um, so those are the areas that you would want to hit on. Like if they say, you know, I just, I, I can't believe in any of that stuff. You can say, well, okay, like, let me ask you this then let's, let's start right from the beginning. Do, do you think there's a God? Do you think God exists? And based on what they say, you can either spend more time on that question or you can move to another question, you know, or you could say, 
what do you, what do you think about Jesus? You know, you can even say, I, I love asking friends and family this. Jesus is such a, a lightning rod, a controversial uh, subject. So I'd be curious to know, what do you think about Jesus? You know, who was he? What do you make of him? And see what they say, you know, and, and based on what they say, that opens up 10, 20, 30 other avenues that you can go. But keep asking questions. Questions allow you to stay in the driver's seat of the conversation and kind of steer it where you want it to go. And at some point, you can start helping them see maybe where their thinking is a bit flawed, or you can start sharing, you know, your own beliefs and your own convictions. I don't want to give the impression that, you know, the only thing you should do is ask questions endlessly, because, uh, you know, Chesterton has that great line that the purpose of an open mind is so that it can shut on something solid. It's like a mouth. You know, you don't just keep your mouth open all the time. You, you want to sh eventually shut it on something solid. And that's what this question-based approach is meant to do. You kind of question, 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 and then, ah, okay, let's, let's, we, I think we've gotten to the root of this. Let's go deeper in that and talk about it. And that's where you can kind of put your views forward. Now, all this sounds hopelessly abstract, I'm sure, but I hope listeners can kind of see how this approach is usually way more effective than someone just coming in and saying, you know, you don't go to church anymore. Well, you're totally wrong and you're evil and you're probably going to hell. And you know, that's where right, we're going to yeah. leave it. That that's going to sway no. nobody. What, what we have to do is dignify the other person through questions, use questions to identify their points of resistance. And then that's where we should focus the conversation. Right. Cause we're, we're, we're defending our faith uh, ultimately because we love the other person and we want them to join us not because we want to prove them wrong. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And again, to bring it back to Chesterton, I mean, who, who could deny that that was his operating principle, even with the people with whom he disagreed, he didn't want to just defeat them. He wanted to win them over. He, he, it, and he was good friends with, with a number of atheists. So that's right. That's yeah. right. I mean, his goal wasn't just to win the argument. Um, and even when they're arguing about things besides religion, whether it's politics or you know food or vegetarianism, or whatever, he wanted to help his friends to find the truth because he knew that that was an act of charity. Thomas Aquinas says that love is to will the good of the other, to want the good for other people. And one of those goods is the truth. So helping someone come to the truth is an act of charity. And so that explains why Chesterton was so bubbling over with love because he willed the good, even for his intellectual opponents. He wanted to lead them to the truth for their own good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I, this is a good half hour accelerated course. I hope we didn't spoil <laughs> your, your actual course and your, your books. <laughs> I'm sure uh, a, good, a good place to continue this, this, uh, this learning is to go right to the, the, the two most recent books you wrote and write to Claritas U, right? Of course. Yeah. You're my, you're my press agent. That was, I yeah, have yeah said I'm better. plugging you <laughs> definitely right now. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, thank you for, for coming to speak with, with us, Brandon. And, uh, and yeah, the, thank you so much. It's, it's been great. Uh, it's been until, fun. yeah, thank you. Until next time, uh, help us to make common sense more common, everyone. See ya. <laughs>